you comfortable with your price where it is right now? Yes, I think stability is what everybody's looking for, both producers and consumers. And this range of 60 to 80 uh, sort of meets everybody's uh, needs. <laughs> and, we're, and we're seeing with this new effectively expanded OPEC, uh, double the size, that despite all the political uh, or geopolitical tensions between some of the key members, when it comes to uh, the oil side, they're able to put those to one side and work together. And we saw that at the, uh, at the recent summit in Vienna. So you've got stability at the top line because the oil price is looking kind of fairly sort of reasonably stable at the moment. Like TI has been falling a little bit of late. Um, what about in the middle of the PL? What are your what does your cost structure look like at the moment? A lot of people are trying to figure out whether the next step is that we start to see cost inflation within the sector. There's not much signs of it yet, so I'm curious to see what's happening now. So I think at these levels, uh, it's manageable. It was when prices were well north of hundred dollars that costs started to really get out of hand and actually uh, impact projects in a, in, a, in a major way. So I think at these levels, it's, it's fairly manageable. In the Middle East, where we are very focused, uh, the costs are not a major uh, issue. We have our, our challenges tend to be above the ground. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, um, uh, whether it's uh, local unrest or... Because uh, you've got a big footprint in Iraq, Contractual terms, yes, in, in Iraq in a, in a major way. Uh, we're the biggest cumulative producer now, our consortium in the Kurdistan region, mainly gas, but also condensate, LPG. Yeah. We currently have three rigs going plus a snubbing unit. Let me jump uh, in here, yeah. right? 60 to 80 is a pretty broad range. Where do you see the price of oil headed and what's your optimum price? So on, on, on the short term, uh, I mean, being an upstream investor, we, we, we look longer term. We're, we're, we're not a, a, a trader. And the short term, things like you mentioned, whether it's Turkey, uh, uh, trade war, uh, can have an impact, as well as countries like Venezuela, actually, much more than uh, even Iran, uh, coming off because of geopolitical concerns. But looking forward, the demand growth uh, is quite solid. Even if it's only a million additional or a million and a half additional barrels, right. we lose three million barrels uh, a day, which means, uh, or per year, which means we need to add a new Iraq or North Sea yeah. every year. And you've and said that before, but yes. then we're in the middle of trade tensions. We're in the middle of emerging market routes. So how much will that hurt to oil consumption? I think even with more pessimistic views and even with more optimistic views of uh, U.S. production, we will still need, uh, you know, growing demand for oil. And a lot of that is not driven by passenger vehicles now. It's driven by petrochemicals, first and foremost. Most of the, most of the items in this studio are products uh, of our uh, business. Right. Trucking, air, and shipping. And, and these are still seeing pretty robust growth, particularly from Asia, uh, from the developing countries. But how do you see the, chi the Chinese economy developing? At the same time, you have all these shale producers in the U.S. that could take some of the space that you've been filling in the past. So there are different views on where uh, the, the, the shale industry is going in, in the U.S. But I think even if you take the extremes of that range, you're still going to need quite a lot of oil. And the two countries that have added capacity significantly in the last few years are the United States yeah. and Iraq. Uh, and we are increasing our footprint in Iraq. We've been awarded three new blocks oil and gas fields in the latest bid round with the federal government in the south. We're waiting for the new government to be formed. Uh, and, and, and those will have been initial, they'll be signed. So we'll have eight fields from the Kurdistan region down to the Kuwait uh, border. And despite all the challenges there, the potential is very high and the uh, contribution to global supply is going to be very important from Iraq and the wider Middle East going forward. What do Iranian sanctions mean short term, medium term, long term? So I think Iranian uh, sanctions, uh, everybody is projecting some amount uh, of Iranian oil to come off the markets, whether it's half a million barrels, up to a million uh, uh, barrels. But we've seen that in the past, in the, in the last few years. I think what was more shocking to the markets was Venezuela. Uh, and that, uh, you know, seems to be getting worse, this, uh, the situation there. So a lot of the countries that are major producers do have these uh, ge geopolitical swings, uh, but the key is you're seeing OPEC plus the other 20 sort of cooperating, uh, and at the same time, uh, d demand growth is, is still quite robust. So the concern is actually underinvestment. Uh, 
we, we haven't yet seen, we're seeing a lot of companies distributing dividends and doing share buybacks and, and adjusting their cost structure, which is all very well. But despite the oil prices coming back up from $28 where they were a couple of years ago, we haven't seen the investment coming back up sufficiently. And the concern would be in a few years, oil price spikes uh, back up because of a lack of supply. But back up to what, 100? And is this a couple of years, as in two, three years? Or you know, in five years, are we looking at oil at 100? And what does that mean to it, consumption? It very much depends on uh, whether we see the, the sufficient investment. Uh, and of course, the question marks over uh, where the US industry is going to end. Uh, the, the, because the growth there uh, seems to be continuing. Just one, just one quick one before I go. Um, the Aramco IPO. The portfolio effect off that, what is that going to have into the rest of the GCC oil market? What's that going to look like if Aramco, this massive market, this massive company comes to market? What is the kind of, just in terms of when you go out and meet investors, I'm curious to know what they're thinking about. So we're a private company. We do have a listed affiliate, Danagas, listed in the Abu Dhabi stock market. Yep. If Aramco lists in the Tadawal in Saudi Arabia, it will clearly bring a lot of uh, you know, interest from international investors. But I think whether or not it lists and when it lists, the, the, the key is that national oil companies in the region, including Adnoc, including Aramco, are now trying to be more like the private sector and more cost efficient. Uh, and more investor friendly, as well as opening up uh, their own countries for more investment in different forms, whether it's IPOing the parent or certain subsidiaries or the different contract models, because they recognize the need to compete with the US, Africa, South America and other oil basins to capture that investment.